Coming up on Bridge City News. Our province's children's minister announces that preschools can reopen next week. The COVID-19 pandemic has hurt the church in many ways. Pastor Kelly Stickle from My Victory Churches stopped by our studio with the details. And our country's indigenous communities will be receiving hundreds of millions of dollars more from the feds in the fight against the coronavirus. Your nation. Your province. Your Southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Roberts. Thanks so much for joining us. Halo Air Ambulance is at risk of going under because of the COVID-19 pandemic. After partnering with McCain Foods and Western Tractor, the life-saving service gave out free fries in exchange for a donation today. The event was held at Western Tractor dealerships in Lethbridge, Tabor and Medicine Hat. As BCN's Ainsley O'Reilly discovered, Halo easily surpassed their fundraising goal. Well, Hal, I've kind of parked myself on the side of the road here in front of Western Tractor in Lethbridge. There's dozens of cars piled up all through the side of the road, all up and down the street just to support Halo Air Ambulance. Their goal is to raise $100,000 in one day. So far, I've seen an outpour of community support. We are definitely going to triple what our, our target was of $100,000 and we're going to be north of $300,000 today. And so we are absolutely um, just blown away by the response from the community. There was kids coming with money out of their piggy banks today and putting it in there for Halo. And that, to me, that was just so touching. I just, uh, it really kind of got, uh, got to the back of my throat and we were just so excited. There's no words. Um, you know, we started off in Medicine Hat. We had to start you know, 15 minutes early because the lineup was out to Highway 3 and and it's been like that ever since. And we just, you know, kept coming down. We, we started a, a hashtag Highway for Halo and it seems to be catching on. And so it's been an incredible day and the, the outpouring of support is is second to none and it's it's just a miracle. 2,700 right colonies got together and raised $40,000 for the cause. The Alberta government announced today that there were 22 new cases of COVID-19, but no new deaths. Our province's Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Dean Anshaw, says places of worship are officially allowed to reopen this weekend, but only for up to 50 people. Faith leaders must take steps to prevent the risk of transmission among staff, volunteers and members of the public who enter their space. Expanded guidance for places of worship is available on our BizConnect website. I also committed to posting guidance for organized outdoor sports and recreation applicable for Stage 1 across the province. I know many people are eager to get outside with their teammates and play their favorite sport. But organized sports events, games and leagues pre present a high risk of transmission and are not yet permitted in stage one. The coronavirus has made life challenging for many, including those in the church. Pastor Kelly Stickle with My Victory Churches says what's confusing now is how the province allows a certain number of kids into the daycares, but not into a children's ministry. As said, we, we can gather. We're not allowed to gather uh, with a children's ministry as of yet. Yet daycares and day camps can, st can gather. So we have a daycare in our facility that can, the kids can come in and be daycare under restrictions five days of the week. But on Sunday we do a service. They're not allowed to be in the children's ministry. Catch the full interview with Pastor Kelly Stickle with My Victory Churches discussing some of the biggest challenges the church is having during this pandemic. That is coming up in the second half of our show. Special graduation ceremonies took place earlier today for the Tabor Police Service, Medicine Hat Police Service, and the Blood Tribe Police. Twelve cadets graduated from the 20-week training program. They also received their academic accreditation through Lethbridge College. Chief Kyle Melting Tallow with the Blood Tribe Police said that even though this is a difficult time with the pandemic, everyone involved came together to ensure that the program remained successful. Following graduation, the cadets returned to their communities to begin their policing careers. An increasingly tech-savvy population of minors, combined with millions of students involved in remote learning during the COVID-19 pandemic, has created more scenarios for children to be exploited. Despite all of the precautions, children still fall victim to online predators. We spoke with two local psychologists about the important things parents can do to protect their kids from the dangers of the online world, including pornography. A lot of shame, a lot of guilt, a lot of hiding. Um, we, we see some isolation, right? You can, it's, this material is built to attract some of our, you know, deepest desires, right? And so um, 
in the same way that junk food is appealing to a lot of people, well, pornography is built to be appealing to especially someone who's got the hormones just going crazy, right? So you can get drawn into the, to the point where you might prefer a screen to an actual person. Having conversations with them, being, staying connected with them is, is the best approach. There are, use, there are filters and um, there's online um, technology that's available to uh, filter and do some screens on what children are accessing online. But the best kind of resource for parents is to have an open and engaging conversations with their children. So, and not to blame or um, not to really get upset when, they're, when they do something inappropriate online. Alberta's Children's Minister says preschools in the province can reopen Monday, but only if they follow certain guidelines. Rebecca Schultz says her government has been working on a plan to make it possible. She says there are around 12,000 kids across the province enrolled in licensed preschool programs. Schultz says because most preschools have morning and afternoon groups, it will give staff time in between to properly sanitize facilities during the COVID-19 pandemic. The Alberta government wants to change the rules on charter schools and homeschooling. The proposed Choice in Education Act would allow a group looking to establish a new charter school to bypass the local school board and apply directly to the government. Premier Jason Kenney says the bill shows that parental choice is the foundation of education. The bill would also allow unsupervised, unfunded homeschooling. Now that playgrounds have reopened, parents are flocking to get out and let their kids run around. As Micah Quinn explains, for parents, it's a huge relief for the little ones who've been cooped up for far too long during the novel coronavirus. Parents in Lethbridge are finally able to bring their kids back to playgrounds. Now that the city of Lethbridge has reannounced the opening of playgrounds starting today, for most parents, it's a sigh of relief. For Salim Barwani, it's nice to be back in Lethbridge to visit and he headed down with his family to Henderson Lake for the day to check out the park and playground. Uh, we spent uh, part of the yesterday here as well as the today as well. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a beautiful park. Barwani says his six-year-old daughter is enjoying the park and getting back to a new normal. Always looking forward to the park's reopening. Uh, really hard for her for to be indoors. Um, always wanted to go out and explore and uh, and uh, just being cooped up in the house was uh, was uh, was very very hard for her. David Ellis, the parks manager for the city of Lethbridge, says the city will not be providing hand sanitizer for playgrounds and families should bring their own. We cannot really provide alcohol-based hand sanitizers at playgrounds just because of abuse and stuff so no there won't be. Lethbridge County is also saying to use hand sanitizer immediately after going off of the equipment as well. For Bridge City News, I'm Micah Quinn. Streets Alive Mission received an impressive donation today. A local business owner said the cancellation of whoop-up days left him with $6,500 worth of products that he would have sold at the event. But now, he's turning his loss into a blessing for others. During this uh, COVID crisis, people of Lethbridge have been phenomenally generous in donating things uh, for our clients who are mainly the homeless, the vulnerable population, the people that don't have any other place to go. Um, they, they don't have access to clothing. So when uh, they come here, they look for fresh clothing. They look for a place to change. They look for, you know, a little bit of dignity. And donations like we just received, they really help out. They really go directly to the clients and they really appreciate it. We do a stall set up right in the whoop up days every single year. So we ordered our stuff for this year, but whoop up days are not going to happen. So instead of keeping it at home and sell it next year. We thought this COVID-19 is here, a lot of people are in need in this crisis. So we decided to donate all of our stuff, which we ordered, which will roughly around $7,000. We still have some more stuff that we'll bring together. And when I spoke with uh, authorities here at uh, Streets Alive, we felt really good that, you know, this will go to really, really good hands. The Lethbridge Bulls will not have a season this year. The Western Canadian Baseball League Board of Governors voted unanimously to cancel the WCBL season because of the COVID-19 pandemic. BCN's Ainsley O'Reilly explains how government regulations and coronavirus protocols have impacted the league. It is heartbreaking that we have to go a summer without baseball, says the WCBL in a statement earlier this week. Bulls general manager and league president Kevin Kavame says that summer baseball means so much to so many. To have, uh, you know, uh, their college age um, uh, 
those years and those years are limited. I mean, the, it's really sad for the players they lose out this entire spring and summer of their college and their college um, uh, summer baseball. Empty stands and an empty field. That's how Spitz Stadium will stay for the remainder of the summer. There won't be a 2020 season because of all of the restrictions due to COVID-19. Social distancing, border closures, and player transportation are a few barriers the league just can't overcome. We all learn that this is, this is not just about baseball, this is about uh, a world uh, crisis and uh, we all have to do our part to bear through it and I think the players will be fine. With an abundance of time to prepare, WCBL league officials are getting a head start on next season. So seriously, we uh, we talked about it on the Board of Governors call and uh, we talked about, you know, the, the ability to sign players earlier for 2021. I mean, we want to give the players that are on our club that uh, that are uh, want to come back uh, an opportunity. So we're in discussions with them, you know, immediately and we can start to sign for 2021 uh, later in June. For Bridge City News, I'm Ainsley O'Reilly. The province of Alberta is teaming up with A&W, Tim Hortons and McDonald's restaurants to provide free non-medical masks through their drive through locations across the province. The initiative to help prevent the spread of COVID-19 will begin in early June. Government officials say they're also working with First Nations and Métis communities to distribute masks to those who need them. This is part of Alberta's relaunch strategy to begin removing public health restrictions and to help reopen our economy. Indigenous groups across the country will be receiving financial help in the battle against the COVID-19 pandemic. Federal Indigenous Services Minister Mark Miller made the announcement earlier today. Knowing that Indigenous communities across Canada needed support to prevent and stop the spread of the virus, Canada acted fast. Today, Canada is announcing $650 million in additional funding to support Indigenous communities to prevent and respond to the COVID-19 pandemic and ensure that we are able to continue to react to the evolving, evolving needs of First Nations, Inuit and Métis communities. Now the funding is in addition to the $305 million already promised for supplies, medical care and facilities that allow for physical distancing. Federal Transport Minister Mark Garneau says Ottawa is banning large cruise ships from Canadian waters until at least October to keep COVID-19 at bay. The move extends and expands the ban that was initially extended to July 1st. Smaller vessels such as water taxis and those used for day trips can operate but are subject to restrictions and tightened safety measures. Today I am announcing updated measures for cruise ships and passenger vessels in Canadian waters. Cruise ships with overnight accommodation and a capacity of more than 100 persons, that includes passengers and crew, will be prohibited from operating in Canadian waters until at least October the 31st. And passenger vessels with a capacity to carry more than 12 passengers will continue to be prohibited from entering Arctic coastal waters until at least October 31st. And that also includes Nunatsiavut, Nunavik and the Labrador coast. Protesters angered by the death of George Floyd, a handcuffed man who died while in police custody in Minneapolis, took to the streets again last night, destroying businesses and buildings throughout Minneapolis, Minnesota. An angry mob gained access to a Minneapolis police precinct and burned it to the ground last night. The violence came amid the third straight night of protests, which have now spread to other parts of the U.S. In Phoenix, earlier today, riot police reportedly fired rubber bullets to disperse demonstrators. Shots were fired in downtown Denver as protesters gathered. There were no immediate reports of injuries, and police fired tear gas to move demonstrators off the interstate. And in Columbus, Ohio, a peaceful protest turned violent with windows being smashed at the Ohio State House. The U.S. National Guard has been called into Minneapolis following another night of unrest that saw more rioting and looting. It came as three days of protests spread to nearby St. Paul and angry demonstrations flared across the United States over the death of 46-year-old George Floyd. Minneapolis Mayor Jacob Fry says National Guard members were being stationed in locations to help stem looting, including banks, grocery stores and pharmacies. There are reports now that Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin, who knelt on George Floyd's neck, has been arrested and charged. He'd worked with Minneapolis police for 19 years. The San Diego Zoo has introduced two rhinoceros calves to their outdoor habitat at the Zoo Safari Park. The mother rhino Asha gave birth to her little one on March 25th. 
while Tanyana gave birth to hers just over two weeks later. So when we first released Tanaya and her female calf, they seemed to be ready to come on out and explore. They took a little bit of time and then they were on their way exploring the rest of the habitat. And when we released Asha and her male calf, they were a little bit slower to start, a little bit more cautious, and really took their time heading out to the rest of the habitat. Tanaya heading into the wallow is a total natural behavior. Uh, we provide the rhinos with wallows out here because that's mainly what they like to do, especially when it starts to get a little bit warm out. Uh, we typically see them in there pretty much all day long, so it was no surprise that Tanaya came out and went straight into the wallow. How cute is that? This may be a nice weekend for dipping your toes into a lake or river. Hot temperatures are on the way. A full look at the weather picture is coming up. Jeanette Roche is here now with a look at the weather forecast. Jeanette, the first official day of summer is not for another three weeks, but this weekend will feel a lot like summer. Yeah, that's right. We're going to have the warm days of summer coming at us this weekend. Overnight, low tonight, 10 degrees with a westerly wind of 20 kilometers per hour, gusting to 40 at times into tomorrow. Look at that, 30 degrees. Finally, that's going to be our first one this year. Sunshine. Uh, we're going to have the humidex of uh, pretty much almost as high as the temperature there. 31 will be the humidex. UV index of 9 or very high, so a bit of humidity, lots of sunshine, high temperatures, time for some sunscreen. A great day also if you want to do like a backyard barbecue party or anything like that. That overnight low also staying very lovely on Saturday evening. 18 degrees will be our low temperature for Saturday night. And then as we look into Sunday, also lots of sunshine. 22 degrees is the high. 23 for Monday, also under sunny skies. A mix of sun and cloud on Tuesday. 21 is the high. 24 for Wednesday. And 20 degrees for next Thursday under mainly sunny skies. Just a bit of cloud coverage there. Not too bad as we look at those temperatures of getting above 20 now, which is our average high. So we're definitely higher than that. The average low, 6 degrees. And with that 18 degree low on Saturday night, we're totally beating that out of the park. 32 degrees was our high temperature back in 1986 and 89 we have our lowest temperature there of zero degrees the sun rose this morning at 5 31 a.m and our friday evening sunset 9 at 27 p.m with uh what is that almost 16 hours or so of daylight it's just lovely to have those longer evenings now after such a long cold winter that we experienced so tomorrow looking at the coast there's a 30 percent chance of showers for both Victoria and Vancouver, highs of 20 degrees in both of those cities. A mix of sun and cloud in Edmonton, high of 28 degrees. They are going to see an afternoon of a chance of afternoon showers there, uh, mainly sunny skies over in Calgary tomorrow, high 27. 24 is the high tomorrow in Saskatoon with a mix of sun and cloud. Sunshine in Regina, 24 is the high, 20 over in Winnipeg. Also mainly sunny skies there. Now, as we look further east, we've been seeing so much humidity building up there, but not as bad tomorrow in Toronto. 20 is, is the high there. Mainly sunny skies, parched, partially cloudy. Risk of thunderstorm, though, for both Ottawa and Montreal tomorrow. Highs of 21 in Ottawa, Montreal's high 22. And as they see that humidity build, they're going to see that risk of the thunderstorm. Same thing for Fredericton tomorrow, high of 25. 27, the high tomorrow for Charlottetown. 16, the high for Halifax. They're going to be seeing a chance of afternoon showers. St. John's, Newfoundland, their high 20 degrees tomorrow under partly cloudy skies. There you go. That is your forecast. Stats Canada says our economy contracted by 8.2% of the first quarter. That is the worst quarterly showing since 2009. That includes a 7.2% drop in March as businesses were forced to close and travel was restricted in an effort to contain the spread of COVID-19. The rail blockades in February, along with a steep drop in oil prices, were also a drag on the economy. Leading economists say with businesses being allowed to reopen, that should help with the economic recovery. They say, however, that it will be a modest recovery and will be more of a marathon than a sprint. Stats Canada also said that household spending was down 2.3% so far this year, the steepest quarterly drop ever recorded. The drop impacted both goods and services. Spending on clothing and footwear dropped 16.4% as many people worked from home and non-essential businesses were closed. Spending on restaurant, beverage and accommodation services fell by 10.9%, but spending on food and non-alcoholic beverages was up 7.2%. 
French car maker Renault is cutting 15,000 jobs around the world. The company says it is part of a 2 billion euro cost cutting measure over the next three years. Renault says close to 4,600 jobs will be cut in France as the company is dealing with a fallout from the COVID-19 crisis. The group's global production capacity will be revised from 4 million vehicles in 2019 to 3.3 million by the year 2024. Volkswagen is spending around 2 billion euros to expand its presence in China's electric car industry. It is the biggest foreign investment announced since the country shut down to fight the coronavirus. The company says it will buy control of its electric vehicle venture with a Chinese partner in a 1 billion euro deal. The German automaker says it will spend another billion euros to become the biggest shareholder in a battery producer. Now, here's a look at today's markets. The TSX was down 69 points on the day to finish at 15,192. The Dow was down 17 points to 25,383. The S&P 500 was up 14 points to 3,044. And the Nasdaq was up 120 points to finish at 94.89. Oil was up $1.78 to 35.49 per barrel. Natural gas was up 2 cents to a buck 85. Gold was up 11.94 to 17.30.27 an ounce and silver was up 49 cents to 17.87 an ounce. Wheat is at $240 per metric ton, barley is also at $240, canola is at 467, and corn is at $229 per metric ton. Live cattle were down a buck 75 to 99.73, feeder cattle were down 15 cents to 135.35, and lean hogs were down 8 cents to 56.85. The Canadian dollar was down slightly on the day to 72.59 US. Recapping one of our top stories this hour, our province's children's minister says preschools in the province can reopen Monday if they follow certain guidelines. Rebecca Schultz says her government has been working on a plan to make it possible. She says there are around 12,000 kids across the province enrolled in licensed preschool programs. What are some of the keys to a successful marriage? Communication? A good sense of humor? Making God the cornerstone in your relationship? Ron Price is a marriage coach and author of the book, Play Nice in Your Sandbox. He shares his insight with BCN's Jeanette Roche in just a moment. Marriage is hard at the best of times, and now with the pressures of the COVID-19 pandemic, some might find it even more difficult. Today's guest is a marriage coach and a court-appointed mediator. Ron Price is also the author of Play Nice in Your Sandbox at Home, How to Enjoy Peaceful Relationships with the Important People in Your Life. Welcome, Ron. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. Oh, Jeanette, the pleasure is mine. Thank you so much. Awesome. Okay, so Ron, that's an interesting book title. What's the significance of this analogy? Actually, Jeanette, it's the second book in the series, second of three. I, in 2016, I came out with Play Nice in Your Sandbox at Work. And in all of my books, the play is an acronym, a four-step model to prevent trivial, insignificant, meaningless things from blowing up on you and becoming a conflict. And I assume you know what I'm talking about. Absolutely. I think we all do. Yeah. Not only were they not a hill to die on, they weren't a hill to get sick on, and yet they're taking over our time, our energy, our lives. So the play is, how do you prevent those from happening at work, at home? And again, in November, I'm coming out with at church, which is an interesting, a whole different matter. But how do you prevent conflict? The nice is, how do you resolve conflict? Significant differences that, Jeanette, we're all going to have with other people from time to time how do you resolve those in a productive manner so and the, and the in the sandbox i've just i just never grown up i guess people <laughs> people ask me where did i grow up i say i'm trying to do it in farmington new mexico so it's it's just kind of playful and helping people realize conflict can be prevented at times it can be resolved when yeah. necessary and like you said, I mean, whether it's at church or home or at work, we're all human, right? And so we have those interactions daily and yeah. it's a challenge, right? Sometimes. And it's fun though, isn't it? It's fun. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, Ron, you're a court appointed mediator. Can you share what your experience has been with couples who maybe put their kids first above, I guess, their spouse? Yeah, they end up divorced. <laughs> That's uh... Uh, and, and I shouldn't be laughing. That's not funny, but it's incredible how many couples have told me, yeah, we, we put our kids first. We stop focusing on the marriage. Jeanette, if you really want to put your kids first, 
you, you, you get some very good, reliable sitters, or you get other couples with kids your age, the age of your kids, and you trade off so that you're going out on regular dates, you're going out and focusing on the marriage, because number one, that's what your kids, they want to be able to come home after they've left and grown up. They want to bring their kids to your home to see both grandparents together. So mm -hmm. you want to put the kids first, you want to focus on the kids, you focus on the marriage. Interesting. And I'm sure that that sets a really good example too for the kids in the long run. Oh, absolutely. Point. Now, most people say that finances are the number one reason for divorce, but you say it's something else, that it's failure to cut the apron strings with your own parents. Please explain that. We, we come into a marriage, Jeanette, with certain expectations based largely on how things were in our family of origin. That's all we know, so that's that's how we assume things should be in our new married home. Well, guess what? Your spouse <laughs> didn't grow up in your home. At least, I hope not. That's a whole nother topic. <laughs> <laughs> they have a different set of expectations. And so the challenge, one of the challenges in marriage is to carve out not yours or mine, but ours. And you've got to leave mom and dad. You can't you can't be running back to them whenever there's a dust up or a disagreement or whatever. Uh, the smart in-laws, when they see you coming under those circumstances, are going to slam that door in your face and say, you go back and fix it, then come visit us. Uh -huh. uh, marriage, you've got to become an us. It's, it's just us. I don't want to say against the world because it's not a negative thing, but no, we're putting a hedge of protection. Nobody's going to tell us what to do. They can give advice if they want. That's fine. But we're making our decisions. We're not doing it our parents' way. We're doing it our way. And if you don't do that, well, you're just setting yourself up for nonstop trouble. Right. That's a good one. Now, the marriage flame tends to dwindle over time, unfortunately. What's your advice for a marriage that might have grown stale? Okay. A actually, Jeanette, can I depress your audience for a moment? <laughs> <laughs> that that flame that you're talking about, that gaga, euphoric, oh, that lasts two years or less. Oh, wow. <laughs> two that years is or depressing. less. Oh. <laughs> Biochemically, it, you cannot sustain that euphoric love. It's supposed to settle in to a more steady, stable, and long-lasting love. And so one of the one of the problems that people fall into is they forget the importance of having fun in their relationship. You know, when they first meet, that's that's all they're doing. They're having fun. They're doing things. And they say, oh, let's do this forever. And and they marry and and they still have fun. But over time and especially when that again, the gaga wears off, uh, life becomes raising the kids and paying the bills. Or is it? paying the kids and raising the bills, whichever. <laughs> Fun gets pushed to the wayside, and that's a huge mistake. In fact, in my play nice model, the P stands for play, play, play. You've heard the expression, the family that prays together stays together. Okay. Sure. That for the theologians. I'm saying the family that plays together has regular date nights just as a couple and fun nights as a family is gonna experience the joy longer, keep the flame, as you said, burning more brightly. Right, and doesn't it seem that the common courtesies that we extend to strangers sometimes get missed in our own marriage? Where are some of these and why do we neglect them at times? You know, Jeanette, how much time do we have? Do we have about three hours? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> but, but the point is valid. We. We're at the grocery store and somebody puts groceries in our bag. We say, thank you. And they typically say, you're welcome. We say please to people, that total strangers that we don't know. But we neglect that at home. We, I think we just kind of take people for granted to an extent. And, and when we ask for something, don't, don't just ask, say please. When somebody does something for you, say thank you. When somebody thanks you, say you're welcome. This is not rocket science. This is not earth-shaking but you know what? Those little things, Jeanette, they do add up over time and, and help people want to, to serve more, love more, encourage more. 
Yeah, remember your your P's and T's. We I've heard the expression mind your P's and Q's. I don't know what that means. I don't I don't know what the Q's are. <laughs> mind your P's and T's. Your pleases, your thank yous, your welcomes. You'll be glad you did. Yeah, good advice. Now, in your book, you define marriage as two imperfect people who join together to try to form a perfect union. You can can you explain this? Well, that's what it is. But what's the chances of that, Jeanette? I don't know if you're you're a betting woman or not, but <laughs> Again, you take two imperfect, hurting individuals who have needs that they're not good at voicing at times, that's a whole nother matter, and they expect the other person to understand and meet those needs nonstop, you're dreaming. You're dreaming, it's not gonna happen. Imperfect people cannot create perfect relationships. And especially, as you said in the beginning under this COVID-19, when we're having more time together, we've got the added stress and the uncertainty and, and perhaps financial challenges. Yeah, imperfect people, that's, uh, you're gonna see the flaws and the faults and the shortcomings in your mate. So if I may, Jeanette, could I, could I cite the L chapter real quickly? I think it fits well here. Sure. The L chapter is look for the good. Again, it, you ask my wife to list Ron's top 10 faults, it might take her 10 seconds, maybe one second per fault. <laughs> you ask her to write down Ron's top 10 good qualities, his positives, well, depending on the mood, depending if we're, if we're in harmony together, it won't take her very long. If we're, if we're not in harmony, it might take her a while to think about the good. So, so force yourself, look for the good. Look for the good and your mate, your children, let them know, you know, I really appreciate this about you. Thank you so much. You're going to start seeing more of it, I promise. Mm -hmm. That's nice advice. Now, we all know the phrase forgive and forget, of course, but you say that that's unrealistic. Why is yeah. that? Yeah, yeah. Jeanette, I don't know about Canada, and I'm looking for an opportunity to say the word oot, because I love the way you folks say oot. Uh, in, in Canada, when you were young, did you hear an expression, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Do you remember what age you found out that was a total lie? <laughs> words. <laughs> Pretty young. <laughs> yeah. Words can be very hurtful. Well, another expression we've learned from way back is forgive and forget. Jeanette, we can't do it. Now, you're young enough, this won't be a challenge for you, but I ask people my age to think back to their first or second grade teacher. Let me put you on the spot. Can you can you recall the name of your first or second grade teacher? Yeah, I can actually. When's the last yeah. time you thought of that person? Um, it's been a little while. Um, yeah, thanks. But, but, yeah. <laughs> but look how quickly, look how quickly you were able to access mm -hmm that information. Yeah. Our brains are such, God made our brains in such a way we don't forget anything. We, we may not be able to recall it when we want to. That's a I promise you that one. But every, every memory, everything that's ever happened to us is in the emotional part of our brain. And something can trigger a memory to bring it right back to the surface with all the power and the pain and the impact. So to say forgive and forget, I might as well say, forgive and eat this building. It's it's not going to happen. The, the trick, if you will, the challenge, is forgive and move on. Purposely decide, you know what? Nope, I have forgiven that. And if I have thoughts come into my mind, I'm, I'm deleting them because right. I have chosen to forgive and yeah. move on. It's an action, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a decision and an action, yes. Mm -hmm. Well put. So uh, most of us who are married are either trying or have tried to change our spouse, but you say that this is a waste of energy. Well, I, I, Jeanette, I, did, I didn't ask you, but are you married, Jeanette? I am, yes. Ever tried to change your spouse? <laughs> I think everybody's <laughs> have, guilty of it a little bit, yeah, right? I, I was going to say, you don't, you don't have to answer that. I was, I was watching the Today Show. This is probably last century, last millennium. It was a long time ago. 
And I was just about to shuttle off and go back to work. And they said in our next segment, an animal trainer is going to come on and explain how she used animal training techniques to change her husband. And I said, oh, this is going to be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, I stayed and I watched it. And I can't remember her name. I would give credit if I could. But she said, you know, when we train animals, we look for those behaviors that we like, those behaviors that we want to see more of, and we reward them. We give them food or compliments, praise, what have you. We let them know, yeah, that's good. We see more of it. She said, I started doing that with my husband. She said, when I saw him doing something that I appreciated, I let him know in no uncertain terms. Wow, thank you. That's Man, I like that. Not over the top, come on, but but realistic. I appreciate that. And she said, you know what? And he began to change. But then Jeanette, she looked in the camera and she said, oh, was it I who had changed? Probably. And Jeanette, I did, a dance. <laughs> I did a dance in my office. It was her. She changed. Because when, you, when your mate knows you're trying to change them, the walls of the fence are going to go right up. You know that. We all know that. So when you stop trying to change and you look for the good and, and let them know you appreciate it, they'll change on their own, which is far, far better than coercive change. You mentioned an acronym HALT, H-A-L-T. Uh, maybe tell us about that. Okay. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's universal that we are not always at our best. We like to think we are, but we're not. So if you're hungry, and trust me, you're, you're not going to be in total control of your emotions, your thoughts, whatever, because you're, you're, your emphasis is on your appetite at the moment, your stomach. If you're angry, ooh, you're not at your best. You, you have left your thinking brain, you're in your emotional brain. You got to be careful. If you're feeling lonely or maybe your needs aren't being met, if you're tired, so hungry, angry, lonely, tired, that's a bad, I don't say a bad state to be in. We, we get there from time to time, but it's a horrible state in which to try to communicate with another human being, especially your spouse. Because if you're, again, if you're under that condition, you're tense, you're irritable, you'll take things the wrong way. That's when you need to know the secret of calling a timeout the correct way. Jeanette, did you know there's a, a right way to call a timeout and a wrong way to call a timeout? I'm sure there is, but I, I don't know the secret ingredient there. Well, may I share it with your audience? Sure. Thank you. I was hoping you'd say yes. <laughs> of course. We, we have a part of our brain that thinks right in the front, the frontal lobe. It's the command center of the brain, if you will. Our thoughts, reason, logic come from that part of the brain. We also have the limbic system, which is the emotional part of the brain. And what can happen to us as human beings, Jeanette, is we can get so upset about something, so agitated, so irritated, we will leave the thinking part of our brain, get smack dab in that emotional brain, and uh, when that happens, all bets are off. So at that time, you have to call a timeout. You have to announce to the other person, you know, right now, I can't do it. I'm too upset. If, if we try to talk now, I'm going to say something or do something. I don't say or do. Time out. But Jeanette, here's the key. You've got to announce the time in. In other words, if I say to my wife, time out, and I storm out, I've made it worse, not better. Because I've left her one. Well, is he coming back? Is he rejecting me? Is he rejecting marriage? She doesn't know. So I need to say one of two things. I need to say, I need a timeout, or I think we need a timeout. How about if we get back together in a half an hour, pick this up at two o'clock, let's talk about this after dinner. So I'm letting her know I'm rejecting the argument. I'm not rejecting her. That's right. Or the marriage. And, and two, two real keys, by the way, I can say, I need a timeout, or I think I need a timeout. God forbid I ever tell my wife, I think you need a timeout. <laughs> I think <laughs> that's not going to go I, over I so well. <laughs> yeah, no, that won't go over well. Yeah, no, that is really fantastic advice. Probably something that we can all use, whether we're married or not. Yeah, no, yeah. that's exactly right. Yeah. Thank you for that, Jeanette. If I may, when I wrote Play Nice in Your Sandbox at work, people think, well, I'm, I don't work, so I don't need that. A hundred percent. 100% of the skills that I teach in the at work book 
are applicable. Probably 80% of the at-home book are applicable at work, and you know, probably 50 or 60% of the at-church book, their relationship skills, they're going to be applicable at home and at work. Because, like I think you said it earlier, relationships are relationships. we got to learn how to get along. Exactly. Ron, thank you so very much for joining us today. We really enjoyed having you on our show. Jeanette, I'm just sorry it's come to an end. I've enjoyed it immensely. The COVID-19 pandemic has impacted many nonprofit groups around the world, including churches. How can the church survive during these difficult times, these dark times? Kelly Stickle is the lead pastor of My Victory Churches in Lethbridge and Southern Alberta. Welcome back to BCN. Yeah, it's great to be with you, Hal. Pastor Kelly, let's talk about how much has changed for the church the last few months with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. Can you share a bit about what your church has gone through, especially when it comes to services? Yeah, well, of course, mid-March, all of the services got uh, closed down in, in person in the buildings. So we transitioned into online services right away, which wasn't that difficult for us because we were already online anyway. But of course, not having a live capture in a room becomes uh, extremely difficult. Not having the people in the room became very, very difficult, uh, not seeing them, not being able to minister to them in the same way. And so uh, we've had to make some qu quite a bit of adjustments. Uh, Let's talk about how that's really impacted your congregation, because you can't be there in person to counsel them, to hug them. You know, mm -hmm. to help nurture them as well spiritually. Yeah, absolutely. how challenging has that been? It's been probably it's been the most challenging part. Uh, the uh, for us, the online service was was the easy part. Uh, the ver the difficult part is being able to uh, find and connect with and minister to people and meeting their needs where they're at without being able to to see them and reaching out to them. And we've got over uh, over three thousand names on our on our list that we've been trying to contact and, and call and make sure that everyone's okay and nobody's slipping through the cracks. So that's been that's been navigating some interesting times have some of the congregants been in favor because of the COVID-19 pandemic of just viewing it online and saying you know what I'll just stay at home thank you until everything passes yes yeah every it, most of our congregation have been happy to to join us on online uh, lots of them miss being uh, with each other in particular and in the building but a lot of them have been very comfortable with with, with online and uh, but we're excited to get back to gathering together now let's talk about how you've been reaching out to the community, the non-church community. My Victory's had a great reputation for doing that in the past. What have some of the biggest needs been in our community that you've seen? Yeah, there's so many uh, needs, mental, physical, spiritual uh, needs. We've been, we've been active in the community before this whole event happened, the crisis happened with My City Care. And so we, again, it was something that we already set up for and ready to go, but we've, we've accelerated our, our reach and we've been um, basically partnering with the city in Lethbridge, as well as the two food banks here. And we've been predominantly putting our focus on food distribution and helping with food and, and to those that are isolated. And to date, I was just told the stat on the way here, uh, to date over the last 10 weeks, we've helped over 10,000 people, 10,000 individuals um, with food or uh, supplies in this time. Mostly in Lethbridge here? Mostly in Lethbridge, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. So let's talk about maybe some of the single moms that you're helping, you know, maybe young families, some of the seniors as well. What kind of feedback are you getting from them? We're getting amazing feedback. Really encouraged. We're getting to the ice Isolated. We're, we're helping uh, feed some of the homeless that have been um, put into, into hotels and different things. We've been feeding them. Uh, we've been helping those who, who have been uh, in isolation, not able to get out to get groceries. A lot of the seniors who can't get their own groceries, we've been able to deliver uh, to their door, doorstep, um, and it was distanced and, and helping a lot of those people. And we're getting amazing feedback. Have you had a chance to maybe reach out to some impacted by COVID-19 here in our community? We're nothing, nothing uh, none of the infected people, we haven't reached out uh, to them. There's been so few cases really, to be honest, in, in Lethbridge and um, in Southern Alberta. And so we haven't, we haven't uh, ministered to any, anybody that's in an active case. Have you had any challenges finding volunteers to help with My City Care as well? Because people may be concerned about being infected from COVID-19. Actually, no, we've been, our volunteers are amazing. They've, we've had no problem. And one of the, one of the I think, most encouraging thing, Hal, is, is over the last while, we've, it's not just our church that stepped up. We've had um, a number of other churches in the community 
that have sent volunteers to My City Care and to, and to what we're doing. And so we've had an abundance of volunteers and we've been, we, they've been amazing. We've been able to uh, fully activate and, and do that. And of course, it's, it makes it difficult. The most difficult part is that you're only allowed to have gatherings of 15 volunteers at any period of time. You have to stay within those within those guidelines, and so it's been actually that's been the more difficult part than actually finding the volunteers. And now the province has said that you can have up to fifty people in the church yep. for a service, but I mean, come on, that's a pretty small service, a pretty small get together, right? Fifty. It is for it is for us. I'm I'm happy that the the province is taking this step. I I really am. I think. Uh, I think the, probably the churches most affected in this whole thing is the small churches, and you know because. You know, we have, as a larger church, we have the technology. We are already online, like I said. We have the staff to be able to do that. But a lot of the smaller churches I've really been feeling for. And so I think opening up at that size is great. But it's really difficult for us as, as a larger church. I mean, a gathering of 50. So we've taken a different uh, approach to this. And we're, we've are we encouraged our small groups, our home groups, to begin meeting in person and, and take that step. And we're opening up in June uh, with our volunteers. We're doing invite-only services, and we're bringing in 50 volunteers at a time to train them uh, for when we can open up a little bit further to, to some of the new regulations and new ways that we're going to have to do church, what the new normal is. So we're taking that as a, a period of time, the 50, as a time to train. I'm just thinking as well at the same time, could you offer more services perhaps? Yes. Maybe a 9, 11, <laughs> a we 1, already, a 3, a 5. A, you yeah, know. we already offer three services in Lethbridge and then plus you know uh, a couple services in Tabor and then a service in Claire's home in, in Lloyd and uh, Okotoks as well. So we've had multiple services around ready but so we're yeah we're talking about the poss all possibilities do we how many do we do and how many can we do and now you do some counseling as well pastor kelly yeah. let's discuss a little bit about meeting the needs of your congregants and especially spiritually and mentally right now a lot of people are feeling isolated and rates of suicide depression are going up because we can't interact with other human beings yes right i think we i don't know if this is if you realize this but I think for me personally, I've realized how little emphasis I put on interpersonal contact. Those relationships. And those relationships. Yeah. And how much they feed us and our emotions. Um, uh, I, I, would, I was with a, a senior yesterday and I had to help him out of a vehicle into in a car. And I put my hand on his back to help him out of the vehicle. And he looked at me and gave me the biggest smile and said, he says, man, he says, having somebody touch me again, he says, that, that just touched my soul. And I was like, you don't even realize it was just a hand on the back and, and not that big a deal. But we really are meant for interaction. And human beings aren't. Isolation is a prison sentence. That's the, <laughs> that's the highest uh, punishment you can possibly get be, is to be isolated. And, and so um, this, is, this is difficult on a lot of people. And it's affecting a lot of emotional health. I think it's affecting marriages. It's affecting parents with, with children. Lots of that uh, going on. Also and addictions as well. Addictions people, right? are yeah up and, and so there's a lot of things that this crisis. I mean the the numbers may be going down with the virus, but I think uh, we we've got a lot of effects, long lasting effects that we're going to have to work through for for a number of years. I think yet. What about the financial hit that the church has taken as well? I mean people congregants come in, they want to do a tithe or an offering, right? But a lot of times if they're at home. You know, they may not be as apt to go online and maybe make a donation to the church online. It's like, oh, I'll get around to it. Never happens. Yeah. So let's talk about the financial toll that you've taken as well. Yeah, it's, uh, th there's extra pressures when you're completely reliant uh, on donations, as churches are. Um, and then basically your main source of income is taken away, which is the offering and gathering of the offerings on a, in a service is taken away from you. Transitioning everybody online is is difficult and it, it does take a, a toll and an effect for sure we've been we've been blessed our, most of our people have have responded and and have helped but i've been counseling a lot of pastors and talking to a lot of pastors that that is not the case um, and they've been hit a lot harder trying you know how do we encourage people to get online and and give and and i think now churches need that uh financial boost and and so i'd encourage anybody and everybody uh, t this is not the time to pull back or hold back or wait until churches churches need the uh, the offerings to come, to keep coming in. And churches need that worship service. They need the singing. But at the same time, the province is saying, no, 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 you're going to spread the COVID-19 virus by spitting as you sing. Yeah. Those are challenges as well for you because those that's a big crazy. part of the service yeah. and worshiping God, right? Yeah, that is a, a new law for those who aren't aware. The, the government has said we, we can gather we're not allowed to gather uh, with a children's ministry as of yet. 
yet daycares and day camps can, can gather. So we have a daycare in our facility that can, the kids can come in and be daycare under restrictions five days of the week, but on Sunday we do a service, they're not allowed to be in the children's ministry. So those are, those are, those are some of the complications. And then this whole congregation. Conflicting, right? Yeah, it's conflicting. And then yeah. these, this, whole, this whole idea of we can gather, but we can't sing. Like singing is somehow uh, like the worst thing you could possibly do. It, it, it doesn't feel like our church. That, that, that's, uh, singing is a big part of our church, a big part of, of yes, everyone's church. Yes, I've been to your church a few times, like a rock concert. Yeah, <laughs> like, oh, right. yeah it's, uh, music is a big part of it. So, so we, we are, yeah, we're having to navigate all of those things, and we're hoping that as uh, things open up a little bit more that, that we'll be able to open up. But have to find creative ways around all that. I can imagine. Now, Pastor Kelly, you said you've met with other pastors as well. What are some of their biggest concerns during this COVID-19 pandemic? Ah, the biggest concerns as we start talking about opening up again is the biggest concern is, is still the perception and the fear and the, the, the idea now of uh, people being afraid to come back to, to church when it, even when it does open up. Is and it I more th- some of the seniors that are no, Well, concerned? no, I think it's more young people, to be quite honest. The, I don't know if you, you know, if you go downtown shopping, uh, it's not the seniors that are hiding at home. They're all out shopping. Um, it seems to be. <laughs> so I don't care. I want out. <laughs> I want right, that's it. And, and it, that's amazing. So Good for them. Yeah, yeah. Th- th- it is. Um, but there's a lot of people that are cautious and, and some, you know, that are vulnerable and some, that, you know, they should be. But I think there's going to be, I think one of my biggest concerns and, and you know, pastors I've been talking to biggest concerns is this growing divide between, you know, um, this is crazy and we should just get together anyway and, you know, forget all these stupid rules and, and meet regardless. And then you got the other camp is like, this is going too fast. We shouldn't meet yet at all. And it's growing divide even in congregations. And I think unity in this time is, is probably the, the biggest thing we need to be aware of and fight for. Have you chatted with some of the government officials as well, expressing your concerns, not just your concerns, but some of the other pastors here in southwestern Alberta? Yes, I have. Yeah. How did that go? It's it's gone well, very uh, receptive, um, very open. We've we've had uh, we've made some headway in, in some things and, and other areas not so much. But they are I've got the sense from our government they're very much listening. Um, they're I think they're proceeding very wisely. I think we're seeing the results in Alberta where they're proceeding um, wisely and and stuff. So I they've been very receptive. I've been it's been it's been an encouraging time that way. And I what I've am sensing is a growing trend of, of more interaction between the church and uh, the government, and I think that's only healthy. How do you feel about the fact that the government says restaurants, pubs, and bars can have up to 150 people, but the church only 50 people? And I mean, a lot of these servers are actually touching the food as they're bringing it out to your table, yet communion, you can't, you can't participate in that just yet. No. There's, again, a little bit of a conflict there. Like, what's going on? The regulations this, this week actually state that no food can be served in a church. Communion is one of those things. And if, if you want to uh, socialize and eat, you know, a meal, go to a restaurant after the service is what the regulations <laughs> state. So wait I'm, a going, minute. I'm like, wait a second. Like, w- w- where is the discrepancy? There are a lot of discrepancies going on. And um, in fairness, there's a lot of things moving very quickly and, and but uh, it, it is, there's a lot of discrepancies that don't make a lot of sense in some ways where, where it's okay to meet in, for instance, with a group of six in, in a restaurant from six different households if we want with no social distancing, but yet we can't, we have to, we can't be within six feet of any individual outside of our home in, in a church service. So how does lots, that make you feel? It, well, it, it's, is that frustrating? It's, bizarre, it's very frustrating because I mean, we're, we feel like we're being held to a different standard for, you know, for, for reasons, um, that, that, you know, we, we're not certain of, uh, as to what they call, uh, churches, um, gatherings, that are, you know, some of the most dangerous out there and super spreader events and all the rest of these things. And yet, and yet I see gatherings happening all over the place where I'm going, well, how is that gathering any different than what we're doing in the church? And it does feel at times that uh, we are being put in a box as, as churches that we are, you know, we're all in small buildings. Um, we're all super huggy and touchy. We all sing I don't know how it's dangerous or, or something happens in there that it becomes this, this dangerous event. And we have state-of-the-art facilities 
Uh, we use social distancing. We do all the same regulations. We're, we're very cautious and careful, and we care for our people as well. And so when you're being forced in regulations where people can gather in a facility away from yours, and uh, you're not held responsible for the, what can happen in your facility, it's very frustrating. How about tapping into some federal funding, like a lot of other groups have done? And churches and nonprofit agencies, do you have that opportunity? Uh, we have access to uh, some grants that we're doing because of my city care. Um, and because we're helping with some of the needs in the community, so we've been able to access some of that. Uh, no federal grants of, as of yet. But uh, again, when it came to talking about, you know, the, a lot of these businesses get fi you know, funding or, or you know, uh, aid and this kind of stuff, uh, churches and charities haven't been considered in that. And so we've been okay. You know, we're large enough and we've been managing uh, well. And so we're not in a destitute situation. So I don't want to sound like destitute, but there's a lot of pastors I'm talking to and a lot of churches that I'm really concerned about whether they will survive. Well, and some churches don't own their own buildings as well. Yes. Are they getting a break from the landlords? Right. You know, some of them are clear title. Yeah. Great. They don't have to worry about it. But other ones, you know, the landlords, they're saying, you know, we, we want our money. Yeah. I talked to a pastor the other day and uh, who oversees 30 churches and two of his churches are, are needing to close down because they just can't afford to keep rent because they have no income coming in and, and, and so they're going to have to close the, their doors because of that. Have to keep praying for God's leading, guidance, wisdom and discernment through these difficult times. Absolutely. Pastor Kelly Stickle with My Victory Churches in Lethbridge of Southern Alberta. Thanks for coming in today. Thanks for having me. And behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News, I'm Hal Roberts. God bless. Thanks for watching.